Welcome to today's Manhattan Project meeting of the International Schiller Institute. Today's meeting is called The Day of Action. Will reality bite British bozos at Glasgow Halloween Summit? LaRouche's Four Laws Take Center Stage. What happened this week was that the International Schiller Institute held an International Day of Action uh, in order to intervene on the uh, announcement which was in fact made as to whether or not the funds, $9 billion, would be released to the Afghanistan government as a way that that government might begin the process of combating the impending disaster, which is being foretold by World Health Organization, World Food Program, and others from the United Nations that will befall that country. As people cur- uh, are I- events concern about the rights of women and other such things, what is known by those in the international community that have dealt with the situation over the past 20 years or 40 years is that the uh, initiated the, the, the engine of terrorism and the engine of, of chaos in that area has to do with the lack of development. And the idea of global economic development, which the Schiller Institute has been, of course, in the forefront of advocating for many decades, is the center of the intervention that we were making stating that the sovereignty of Afghanistan required that those funds, despite whatever anyone's uh, view of the present government might be, should be made available precisely for the purpose of allowing that government to do certain stopgap initiatives to prevent chaos. Let it also be noted that that $9 billion represents approximately the monthly expenditure of the United States military over the course of 20 years in Afghanistan. Came out to approximately that much. Um, perhaps it may even be, have been more. So this week we conducted an International Day of Action. And what we're going to do now is show you some of the scenes uh, from those interventions that we attempted to make and deployments that we did around the world. Hi, my name is Stefan Ossenkopp. I'm speaking in front of the U.S. Embassy in Berlin. Hi, I'm Emma Ruder with the Schiller Institute out here in Michigan. Here we are in the despliegue international. We are here with the team Nelly, Humberto y Wendy. De Guadalajara de Uga, Colombia. Hi, this is Daniel Burke with the International Schiller Institute. And I'm here along with some other activists like him. Uh, across the street from St. Patrick's Cathedral in Midtown Manhattan. To participate in the International Day of Action with the Schiller Institute uh, petition a call to release the funds of the Afghan people. Uh, It is an unprecedented scandal that the U.S. government, but also international uh, donors uh, such as the World Bank and the IMF are withholding funds that legally belong to the Afghani people. We've got a team of people here talking to people going by, getting out a tremendous amount of the statement, the petition uh, calling for these funds to be released. So we've had a interesting response here obviously it's all mostly young people we probably got out about 300 of the petition Uh, i mean the response that we're getting uh i think is there's a range uh, between some people who are really studiously trying to avoid thinking about this talking about it at all Uh, but on the other side people who agree it's a matter of the question of your name the nature of man Uh, It is an unprecedented scandal that the U.S. government, but also international uh, donors uh, such as the World Bank and the IMF are withholding funds that legally belong to the Afghani people. Under the assumption that punishment is somehow going to improve the conditions for Afghans and otherwise. The only way that you can really begin to address this crisis is if you start with economic development. So we are urging the U.S. government, but also the World Bank, IMF, to unfreeze funds so that that the Afghani people can be taken care of and they don't have to be uh, punished collectively. There are a million children in Afghanistan that are on the verge of starvation, and uh, it's up to us to make sure that that uh, becomes the the basis for a beautiful new generation um, devoted to the reconstruction and development of that country to support that ability. The Schiller Institute believes that tragedy and decay need not be the characteristic of daily life in the transatlantic sector or anywhere else in the world. That's largely based on the notion of being able to change uh, through an aesthetic education of mankind 
the disposition to failure, the disposition to self-destruction that is characteristic often of failed societies, not failed states in the way in which people like to define it, but failed societies like the one that we are experiencing in present-day transatlantic civilization. We'll be much more about this a little bit later. But this is not merely a matter of policy. Uh, the content of policy, as Lyndon LaRouche used to say, is the method by which it's made. What we're going to do is to show you an excerpt from an April 2002 discussion that Lyndon LaRouche was having with a, 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 an Egyptian journalist about uh, Afghanistan, about the characteristic of policymaking in the transatlantic world. I often compare the situation of the U.S. government today to that of Rome under Nero. It, you, that you have actually, you see on, on a Nero, this absolute insanity was running the Rome from the top down. People were killing each other. Just burn the capital. And the, like that situation. What we have is a tragedy, a true tragedy, which the controlling actors at the top in the United States are actually out of control. They're like characters in a Greek tragedy, headed toward the doom of their society. If, this, if they go on this way, they may destroy the world, but they will also destroy themselves. They don't think strategically. Look at, look at Afghanistan, for example. 20 to 30,000 fighters in mountain warfare could pin down a quarter million American troops there almost indefinitely, as long as the, the arms flow in there. And the same thing that happened will happen. That is not the, this is not the end of the Afghanistan war, it's the beginning, as the Soviets found out when they first went in there. These people don't think. Getting into an Afghanistan war was insane. Getting, allowing the Middle East war to develop was insane. There is, no, there is no intelligent motive in the sense of a real U.S. interest for such a thing to happen. Do the American people have really, if you put in aside the power, the money, the companies, have the power, the enough power to tell them stop, enough is enough? They, if sense, implicitly they do. If they, if they understand that, but the American people are still largely captured by an illusion, a delusion that this economic system will somehow work out all right. They're sitting in a tragedy. I mean, look at, think of every tragedy, every, the classic Greek tragedies, or any other tragedy. What you're looking at here, if you look at it from my standpoint, of a historian, philosopher, and so forth, what you see is, you see my nation as part of a civilization that is destroying itself. And the actors on stage are like the actors in any tragedy who are all contributing in their own way to the doom of a civilization which has lost its grip on the reality they need to recognize. Can you save it? Well, in, in philosophy and in history, we have a concept which is like that of Friedrich Schiller, the concept of the sublime. That yes, a tragedy is caused by the people themselves. Not necessarily because they decided to do something badly, but because they was allowed themselves to be stupid, and contrary to their own interest. Therefore, the, how do you save them? Is it possible to save a nation which appears to be doomed from its own tragedy? Well, Schiller raises the questions in things like Jean d'Arc, for example, the, the play of Jean d'Arc, and other plays, that, that this concept of the sublime, the function of leadership, and it comes down often to individual leaders or small groups of leaders who have the imagination and the ability to introduce a new factor into the situation which can capture the imagination of the people and show them a bright light that leads out of the, out of the darkness. That's our only chance. And I sit here saying, I may be successful in changing the United States, I may be doomed, but I have to act for the success, even if I'm doomed. That's the way I must act. And I must act with other people around the world who are concerned about humanity each concerned about their nation, but also about humanity. We must save humanity from this terrible danger. This is not a little problem. This is not a Middle East war. The Middle East war is a symptom of a decadence of civilization, which unless stopped, could be the fuse that explodes the world in the chaos. What we want to do is to give a contrasting view using uh, Friedrich Schiller's idea of the punctum salience. This is not merely the idea of a so-called branching point. That's the banalization in which it's thought about. But these ideas that look at 
the difference in outlook, the actual philosophical difference in outlook, which one can apply to life and to one's own life. Uh, and, and that is, could be said to be the difference between a man, men and beasts. Uh, there's a, uh, a newsletter, which was just released by the London Economist, which gives a good ind indication of this. We're going to quote it. This was uh, just out uh, yesterday. Uh, and they're discussing the issue of the COVID-19 circumstance and the idea of living with the COVID coronavirus and the death that comes with it. They stated this, all pandemics end eventually. COVID-19 has started down that path and will gradually become endemic. In that state, circulating and mutating from year to year, the coronavirus will remain a threat to the elderly and infirm. But having settled down, it is highly unlikely to kill on the monstrous scale of the past 20 months. In a briefing this week, we examine how the world economy will eventually learn to live with COVID. Though the destination is fixed, the road to endemicity is not and in a in a, in a leader, we argue that the difference between a well-planned journey and a chaotic one could be measured in millions of lives. The end of the pandemic is therefore a last chance for governments to show they have learned from the mistakes they made at its start. Meanwhile, China has decided it does not want to live with the virus. Since the early days of the pandemic, that country's aim has been to eliminate the coronavirus entirely from within the mainland's borders. But even as the handful of other countries with zero COVID policies, including Australia, New Zealand, and Singapore, move to relax them, China is holding out. We ask, how long China can maintain such a strict policy? This outlook, which says that we are going to learn to live with a plague that's going to kill millions upon millions. And of course, it doesn't say how we're supposed to do that. Uh, it doesn't it begin to indicate what the medical implications of that are, not to mention the fact that it never even uh, alludes to mutations and greater virulence or, or, or the problem of understanding the origins in the economic policies of the London economist itself, as opposed to merely in some lab. Since that's the case, how could we presume, or how could they presume, that this last chance for governments to show they have learned from the mistakes they made at its start would go anywhere? How, how, can, that, how that, can that happen when they themselves, at the London Economist, haven't learned? They reference China, and they reference uh, what we are going to argue is a mythical China. They, they don't want to reference the true China, the actual China, which is leading the world presently, uh, in an anti-Malthusian direction. It's something that's likely to be discussed in just a few weeks at what we've referred to as the Halloween summit, about which we'll say more a little bit later. Uh, but before we do that, what we're going to do is to have you hear from, uh, uh, well, both two of our panelists today, I think we should introduce both of them, which is Bill Jones from Executive Intelligence Review is going to speak to us first. Uh, and then uh, Diane Stair, longtime associate with Lyndon LaRouche, uh, and who has been very involved in this recent mobilization will have a lot to say about that and some of the upcoming matters of what the Schiller Institute's got planned uh, in the next weeks. So, Bill, we'll go to you first. Okay. Very happy to be here today. I think it's a very important topic of talking about. Stan, uh, none of this can be resolved, the Afghanistan problem or any of the other major problems facing the world without cooperation by the United States with both Russia and China. And unfortunately, in both these cases, uh, the U.S.-Russia and the U.S.-China relationship are really on a uh, almost a war footing in many respects. There are signs to the contrary, but uh, there is a serious crisis in both these uh, situations, making it very difficult uh, to work together to find a solution to these particular problems. And I think what I would like to deal with today, of course, is the misunderstanding uh, that people here in the United States have about the People's Republic of China, or what you used to be called Red China or uh, Communist China, uh, which ironically 
uh, is creating a situation of great economic growth, which is stimulating and which is a, uh, a, uh, 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 an outlet uh, for the entire world, including the capitalist economies of Western Europe and the United States. And in order to resolve that situation, we've got to understand exactly what China is doing, which goes far beyond uh, simply the role that the Communist Party plays in China uh, to a much greater uh, role and greater stage in which they're playing on, where they're offering or converging on what I would call a new paradigm for mankind. This came uh, uh, to me uh, very clearly um, in, a, in, a, in a way, in, in a speech that was given this, uh, this last week by China's President Xi Jinping. Uh, this is a year of celebration. This is the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party of China, and there have been a lot of celebrations with regard to that in China. But it's also the 110th anniversary of another revolution much earlier than even the existence of the Communist Party in 1911, whose uh, leader or whose uh, four uh, figure was uh, uh, Sun Yat-sen, who really is the creator of modern China. And of course, uh, during the course of uh, history, of course, the Sun Yat-sen has been often associated uh, with the, the Kuomintang, which he founded, and is often uh, seen in the connection with the uh, uh, Taiwan celebrations of the KMT. But he also plays a major role within, uh, uh, within uh, the People's Republic of China as well. But I, I think a, a step forward was taken in this, in these celebrations this week, uh, which was addressed in which the role of Sun Yat-sen in today's China was addressed by President Xi Jinping. So we have a, a short clip of a speech, a longer speech that he gave, a short clip where he's talking about uh, the role of Sun Yat-sen. Sun Yat-sen Wei 进步浪潮，连续发动武装起义，推动了革命大势的形成。And to get an idea of who uh, Sun Yat-sen actually was, uh, I want to play another very short video uh, with uh, uh, some of the scenes from his life. There, there is no commentary here, but I'll mention here, you see the flag of the uh, Kuomintang going up, probably in Guangdong, which was the headquarters of, uh, uh, of uh, Sun Yat-sen. The pole, of course, you see is bamboo, did a lot of things in bamboo in that area. And here you have, of course, the masses in which he's addressing uh, in one of his speeches. Was educated as a doctor in Hong Kong, but at a very early age, he uh, uh, began his role of organizing a revolution in China to overthrow the Qing Dynasty and to create what became the first republic in, in Asia, the Republic of China. Here he is at a military ceremony. He organized a military operation. It was a military operation. They began in the south of China, which was Sun's uh, stronghold. And uh, really, he had a project of moving to the north in order to uh, fight the warlords who controlled the other sections of the country and to bring uh, China together as one nation. 
Uh, he died before that began, but this so-called Northern Expedition was then carried out and was successful in creating a unified China. This is Sun with his wife, Song Ching Ling. Um, she also was a, a political force in her own right. Uh, after uh, Dr. Sun's death, uh, she became really the chief representative in one, many respects, the only representative of, uh, of his ideas, uh, which uh, to many, in many respects were abandoned uh, by his own party. And this is the funeral of Dr. Sun in uh, 1925, relatively, the relatively young man, but he had cancer uh, and, uh, and he died uh, of the cancer. Was buried originally in Beijing, um, here out in the Western Hills. Uh, his, uh, uh, his grave was later, they built a major uh, monument to him uh, on the Purple Mountain in, uh, outside of Nanjing, which he had named as China's capital city uh, in this new republic. And it was built much along the lines of the Lincoln Memorial because uh, Sun Yat-sen was a, a very a strong supporter and admirer of Abraham Lincoln. So what were his ideas? Um, Sun Yat-sen spent most of his life trying to organize revolutions and he, he organized many, many revolts. Uh, he spent most of his life, I think, uh, almost as a fundraiser, uh, because in order to carry out a revolt, you needed, you know, guns and ammunition, things like that. So he had to collect money to, uh, uh, to do this. And he traveled all over Asia in order to do that, because you had the Chinese diaspora uh, was dispersed, uh, largely you know, in countries, Malaysia, Indonesia. Uh, and uh, he felt that they would support this idea of a unified China, uh, and therefore he was doing a lot of work with regard to that until the revolution actually occurred. Uh, he, this was his main task in, in many respects. Uh, as, aside from his own writing and his own uh, polemicizing uh, against the Qing dynasty. Uh, in fact, when the revolution actually broke, broke out in Wuchang, which is uh, the southern part of Wuhan, uh, the southern uh, half of the, uh, on the Yangtze River, Wuhan is a big city, everybody knows because of the talk about the COVID, but on the south side was an independent city called Wuchang. In the north, it was Hankou, and it was Wuchang that the revolt uh, broke out, and Dr. Sun was on one of his fundraising tours uh, in the Midwest. I think he was in St. Louis when he found out that the revolution occurred, it was victorious, and so then he headed back to, uh, to China and became uh, the president. And his main task after that was to work out a plan of action for the, the rejuvenation of China. This is a notion now, which of course is central in what President Xi Jinping has been talking about and is central in that program that everybody has been looking at in terms of the tremendous economic development of science, uh, in health, uh, in, uh, in living standards, in the poverty alleviation, this, this is all comes under this banner of the rejuvenation of China. But this was originally, as President Xi said in his statement, this was originally a concept of Sun Yat-sen. He formed his first organization formally in Hawaii, where his brother was working, he was living there, and he called it Revive China. And so that was the, the gist of his, uh, of his task. What he did, when, of course, after the... Um, uh, after the success of the revolution, and I won't go into any of the details of this, uh, it was uh, extremely complicated, but he wanted to work out a program for rebuilding China, making China again into a, a, a strong and modern nation. Uh, and remember, it was extremely poor 
um, largely peasantry, living uh, subsistence level, uh, largely uh, 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 subject to the dictates of, of the various landowners. A tenant farming was, uh, was the major uh, uh, occupation in old China. And there was a lot of poverty. There was a lot of misery. Uh, children, you know, that they couldn't afford, they were left in, in the garbage to die. I mean, it was just a horrendous situation. And it was his task to try and find a method of rebuilding this. And he, he was very well read. He read the Federalist Papers. Uh, he read Karl Marx. It was critical, but he read it because he was looking for something that would be appropriate for China. And he realized that none of the so-called social policies that were being conducted would be totally uh, relevant to China because they had to take, take into consideration Chinese culture and Chinese conditions, including you know, the way of life that had been in existence for you know, over 5,000 years. He had to transform this using the building blocks that were already there. Uh, and the most extensive uh, program that he had was a series of lectures that he gave really towards the end of his life in which he introduced what he called the three principles of the people. The three principles were nationalism, democracy, and what he called the people's livelihood. A nationalism, of course, was important because there was no nationalism in China. People were really uh, more associated with their clans and family. Family plays a big role still in China. Big families get together, hundreds of people in the same family. They still, every year, they have these anniversaries. And, but they didn't think of the nation. So he had to create a sense of the nationhood because unless people see beyond their immediately immediate family connections, uh, they will not understand the means of, of, of developing their own country. So that nationalism was number one. Democracy was number two. But he looked at all the, uh, uh, the facts, uh, all, all the examples that he had from Europe and the United States. He took a lot from, from things within the U.S., the, the American system in particular. Um, in, the, in his lectures, um, Alexander Hamilton plays a major role. Uh, he says, here we have, you know, this fight between Hamilton and Jefferson with regard to democracy. Jefferson wanted this pure democracy. You know, everybody is totally equal and makes his own decision. Uh, Hamilton wanted to put restrictions because he felt, as uh, as Plato did, that uh, absolute democracy can lead to mobocracy and, and can be, you know, uncontrollable. And therefore, he sided in, in that respect with Hamilton. He thought something like this should be instituted in, in China. Uh, he was also in favor, of course, of the protective tariff, which uh, Hamilton had in, introduced uh, within the United States. Um, so this was his tendency. He felt that if we have these means, we can begin uh, to, uh, to rebuild China. But in these lectures, and if you look at them, and, and I follow, I read them, and I will follow them closely, and I also read what Xi Jinping says in his speeches in the poverty alleviation. And if you look at all the points that were raised by Sun Yat-sen uh, in this detailed discussion, you know, he talked about agriculture, he talked about, you know, the uh, denuding of the forests, you know, the need for new forests, uh, the need for uh, electrical power. Uh, to use the the waters of the rivers, the Yangtze and the other rivers, to produce electricity, uh, to introduce machinery, uh, to also to nationalize the railroads and the communication and those things which were in the general interest would have to you know be under the control of of the central government rather than private enterprise. Uh, he would introduce the market, but the market would be controlled. It was more of a Hamiltonian system. Uh, than anything else. And um, you, you look at that and you look at everything that has been done in the, uh, this poverty alleviation. China has just released a white paper which extensively indicates what they have done in the last 30 years in all these areas. And you would see that every one of the points that, that, that Sun Yat-sen was uh, pointing out uh, have been realized by the Communist Party in their own program. So in one sense, especially important for Americans, 
is to see that that the uh, the basis of the nation of China was created by Dr. Sun Yat-sen, a follower of Abraham Lincoln, uh, a devotee of aspects of the American system, uh, with Chinese characteristics, of course. Uh, but and and therefore, what what is being done today is not simply that the Communist Party is realizing this problem. They're realizing the vision of Dr. Sun Yat-sen. And and the vision of Dr. Sun Yat-sen was not simply uh, an imitation, a mere imitation of other countries. It was the creation, uh, effectively, of a new paradigm, a new way of looking at life. And that that was especially uh, to be noted in the third principle uh, that he introduced, which which was the principle is called people's livelihood, uh, min sheng in Chinese, men being people, sheng being life. And he says, you know, we've looked at all these social philosophers. He says, look, Marx, and, and he appreciated him as a social critic, but he said he was wrong. He, you know, he thought that there's this class, uh, this, the class differences were what going, were going to be the, 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 the movement of social progress. He says, what moves social progress and, and what, what causes revolution is not you know, the difference in classes, it's the deterioration of the conditions of life of the people. The, the people's livelihood is what is key. And to maintain and preserve and to honor and to cherish the people's livelihood is what should be the goal of government. So that Minsheng, he said Minsheng is an old, it, it was an old Chinese concept. It's been around for a long time. You'll find this stuff in, in, in Confucius as well. It's not something new, but it had a new content now because in rebuilding China, the, the basic principle, of course, was to uh, create a situation in which the livelihood of the people would be improved, would be the center of attention. And of course, that's, that, that's also what has been you know, emphasized by President Xi Jinping uh, in the latest, uh, uh, latest decade was the need for you know the orientation of all the cadre of the Communist Party. Their sole goal is to improve the people's livelihood. So, so in one sense, you have this realization of the vision and, and what, you know, what, what Xi Jinping did in honoring Sun Yat-sen was not simply remembering an old, you know, a, an old hero of uh, the revolt, but also was honoring uh, the principles on which uh, on which she, uh, Sun Yat-sen wanted to base China. And it's very important because, and is understood, I think, by the Chinese government, because they had uh, the ch- new Chinese ambassador here in the United States also had a meeting with 100 Chinese representatives from the United States, representing, I think, over 80 organizations. Most of these people were not members of the Communist Party. And he talked about this, uh, the vision of, of Dr. Sun Yat-sen to get them to understand that what's China, what China is doing right now is not simply the, uh, the attempt to uh, improve or to honor the role of the Communist Party, but to realize the goals that have been in operation since Dr. Sun Yat-sen began his, uh, his campaign. And in that sense, an attempt to bring together the, the Chinese diaspora and also, most importantly, and this was a subject uh, of the speech uh, as well, was the the situation in Taiwan, which is becoming really a uh, a point of uh, of conflict uh, because of the the foolishness of the uh, leaders of the uh, Democratic People's Party in in Taiwan who are talking about independence, and the foolishness uh, of the people within the Biden administration who are trying to play on this. In, a, in an attempt to to weaken China, and I, I think that he he also felt President Xi that this would also be an attempt to give an olive branch to bring the Taiwan situation back to the type of situation that ha- that existed ten years ago, where they had their autonomy, uh, and, but they had the good relations with the People's Republic of China. And perhaps if they didn't have this outside interference, uh, that uh, it, this would be uh, done more successfully. The other thing about Sun Yat-sen, what he said, and he was realized that this was 
a new paradigm for Asia. And, and this was, as President Xi said, is the first republic in Asia was set up under Dr. Sun's uh, guidance. Uh, he also wanted to expand that to the rest of the world, to create the prosperity in China and to bring it also to its neighbors. And if we're looking at the, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, we see that this is exactly what is being done in China today. But I mean, for our own people, I think it's, it's important that the, the role of Dr. Sun Yat-sen, which is convergence on the best years, on the best thinkers in the United States, uh, has got to be made understood to the American public who know Lincoln, you know, who know Hamilton, at least to some extent. Now he's starting to be, forgot, maybe he's re revived again. But they, these are our ideas as well. This is a new paradigm as well for us. And in one sense, it's, it, it's what the United States used to be. But the issue at hand is not simply the Communist Party you know, versus the Biden administration or China versus the United States. The issue at hand is, will we continue along the old paradigm or will we be able to find a new paradigm in which the people's livelihood can be improved and met and that we can have, you know, the pursuit of happiness that is indicated uh, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, Declaration of Independence. This, I think, is extremely important because unless people understand that they're going to be going down the entire wrong pathway and we could, you know, become into a serious conflict that can easily be, be avoided. We have our own representatives for this, uh, this new paradigm. The old paradigm is the British Empire. It is the exploitation of countries that are weak by countries that are strong. And it was this that, that Dr. Sun was trying to break through. But it's this that's being defended today by the AUKUS, by the Australia-British-US collaboration against China. And I think it's my feeling that if Dr. Sun, uh, if it was not the Communist Party, but if it was Dr. Sun was able to live and continue to guide the Kuomintang, and they came to power in China, and they instituted Dr. Sun's idea of democracy, which is not simply this parliamentary, you know, one man, one vote, but something much deeper than that, in which the interests of the people and the decisions of the people are decided by the people, you know, and for the people, then I, I think it would also be opposed in the same way that the role of the Communist Party is being opposed today. Because what is being defended is the old paradigm of oppression, of control, and of, uh, you know, we set the rules, whereas what you would have, what you have today and would have under any regime is that China, with its own culture, with its own thoughts, with its own tradition, would want to have a say in the world as well. So this is something that, that goes far beyond uh, any uh, blatant anti-communism. It has to do with the existence of a developing country like China being able to come into the modern world and have being having being able to have a say in their future. I think that would be in the interest of the United States. There is nothing that really separates us so that we're in uh, contradiction with uh, uh, the development of the People's Republic of China. If we decide to cooperate, this will be better for us and it will be better for them. And they would be much more happy, as was indicated at the last meeting, between uh, Sullivan, Jake Sullivan, the, our NSC advisor, and China's representative, Yang Jiechi, is that China does not want to use the notion of competition with the United States. They want cooperation. And I think we have to try and get Americans to understand that this is the way we have to go because it's in their benefit and it's in their interest. And that's really a part of our tradition as well. All right. Well, thank you very much, Bill. We're going to have a lot of questions for you. There's already one or two that have already come in. Uh, and if we can, I'd just like to show a, uh, the uh, pamphlet that the, that's being circulated by the sister organization of the uh, Show Institute, the LaRouche Organization, The Coming U.S. Economic Miracle on the New Silk Road. You see it there on your screen. 
this pamphlet is available and it is part of the general mobilization that's being carried out by people of goodwill, in fact, in the United States and all over the world. Uh, on the back of that pamphlet, which we may not be able to show you there, is a picture of Dr. Sun Yat-sen uh, with Abraham Lincoln. I know it's a, yeah, you get the idea there. I think it's clear. Yeah. Uh, and uh, some uh, of the organizers uh, have been getting questions about that. The people see the question and say, what's this communist doing on the back of the uh, pamphlet with Abraham Lincoln? And then they're shocked to find out that Dr. Sun Yat-sen was one of the great proponents of what's called the American system, and specifically of the three principles of the people, of government above, by, and for the people. Uh, what we'll do is, we'll, as I said, and I'm getting more questions to coming in, um, for uh, Bill and for in terms of the discussion. But we want to go right now to Diane Sayre, who will have various, not only comments on what we've just heard, but can tell us a bit more about what's been happening all week uh, on the behalf of the Schiller Institute. So Diane. Sure. Well, I think people saw some of the footage of our days of action. We've also had uh, deployments of LaRouche Associates to the campuses and Actually, on Saturday, October 23rd, one week from today at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, there will be a conference call for young people uh, that I would say to be specific under the age of 35 uh, or extremely young at heart people with Helga Tsepp LaRouche because we need to create an international resistance to the fascist Malthusian policy which is being promoted in the name of the Green New Deal or the Great Reset, and as people know, you have coming up, uh, starting appropriately enough on Halloween, the COP26 uh, Glasgow Scotland conference, where these ghouls will gather together uh, to discuss the uh, their view of the problems of the planet, such as overpopulation and too many uh, carbon footprints and eating meat and things like that. Um, it is really our intent that such a conference would not occur at all. If leaders of nations are coming together, they should come together for the purpose which Helga Zeplerouch recently defined, which is to establish a world health platform so that we can put an end not only to this pandemic, but to prevent any future viruses from becoming pandemic because the standard of living and the standard of health care is such that these things do not have the opportunity to spread in that way. Now, what I wanted to do is take something head on because I can say in my own organizing in this last week, um, we meet many people and many people say, well, I, I know I'm really experiencing this hyperinflation. I know exactly what you mean. I understand exactly what you mean. And then something occurs, uh, like a grocery store runs out of food, or there's a blackout for three days, or something like that, and the person is shocked. But that is what we're talking about. That is, this is not a theory that we're having a hyperinflationary blowout. We are in this now. And you're going to have a very dramatic increase in the death rate in nations which continue to cling to the sinking ship of this quantitative easing British liberal imperialist system, as opposed to getting off of that ship and going back to the American system and not feeling so exceedingly threatened by the success of nations like China, who may have a different culture, a different form of government at the moment. But as you heard from what Bill said, there's a certain um, kernel of universality with the principle in our constitution of the general welfare. Uh, but to get that, uh, people have to liberate themselves from a lot of their Delusion. So, uh, Dave, if we could go to the slides that I have from, I think, a very important book um, by Mr. LaRouche, which um, I don't know if the first edition was from 2007, but that's what it says. So, uh, The End of Our Delusion, it's called. And if you can go to the first slide. This is in the foreword from Mr. LaRouche. 
To halt a tragedy, reforms are never sufficient, since such tragedies are the fruit of mass delusions from higher social ranks of society on down. It is indispensable that we change the entire system's relevant set of prevailing axiomatic assumptions. Those are assumptions, such as that belief in free trade, which has been a crucial factor in the mass behavioral factor impelling popular opinion into the self-destruction of the U.S. economy, which we have experienced during the recent three and a half decades. Next, every known culture of mankind in history so far, whether a happy or a wretched one, presents us with a people who at large are engulfed within an intricate mass of axiomatic-like assumptions. Some simplistic opinion would describe such a population as programmed. Others would refer to sets of false beliefs which either are or pretend to be universal physical principles as the so-called quote unquote laws of the universe. Against this reality, the virtual idiot is the man who insists that his judgment is not affected by such cultural environmental fences around the range within which his mental processes are permitted to wander. We sometimes speak of accident proneness or of an individual controlled like an enraged dog on a leash by his or her most, most gripping obsessions. Now, hold on for a minute, um, because I just want to say a little bit about what we've heard so far. So you can reflect on the kinds of beliefs that people express, like why is the price of food so high or the price of energy? Well. People have this mythological belief in the law of supply and demand. So you make something scarce and there's a greater demand. There's a lot of it. And, and when there's a greater demand, the price goes up. If you have a whole bunch of it on the market, the price goes down. But of course, these things can be completely artificially controlled and actually have nothing to do with production or even your capacity to produce. because. For example, the United States, the American farmers actually could double fruit, food production with a conscious effort, and it's urgently needed. And that would be a much better course to survival uh, than what we are thinking. So, but what people don't often reflect on is how your own thinking is shaped that the ideas that you cling to as being so precious and belonging to you and things that you really truly thought of by yourself could not have occurred in your mind but for the society and the culture in which you live. Now go to the next slide. So this is the pressing question. What are the powers that control your reactive decision in the proverbial heat of the moment? And we see a great deal of this. Uh, think about people's anxiety around the pandemic. So we have had um, a, a steady erosion. And if you take Ramsey Clark's point about the case of Lyndon LaRouche being precedent set, setting of our rights, the right of discussion, the right to have a disagreement, the right to have an election, freedom of speech, freedom of discourse. I mean, LaRouche early on in 1971, after he defeated Abba Lerner at that famous debate where Lerner blurted out, if Yalmar Schacht had been listened to, Hitler would not have been necessary. So here you have a Jewish professor saying that Hitler was necessary to get a certain economic policy through and thereby losing the debate. LaRouche was told by another academic, Sidney Hook, that, well, you may have won the debate, but you've lost because we will make sure that no one will ever debate you again. So we have an, a situation in which people are very alarmed, perpetual war, 
arbitrary rules coming down to protect our nominal security, and then the pandemic. So what do people get absolutely hysterical about is whether or not to wear masks, whether or not to have a vaccine, as if wearing a mask is somehow the biggest threat to your freedom that ever occurred. Well, this is the, the heat of the moment and it's shaped by a culture. So you have lost your freedom of speech. You've lost your freedom to have a fair election. You've lost your right to have a productive economy. We've nearly lost the Republic, but the enormous emotion is put on this question of mask wearing, which some professions, dentists, uh, painters, cleaners, have been wearing masks for many hours a day while they work and they haven't died from it or suffered from it. But this is, but, and it allows, it creates the conditions where you're not actually fighting on the fundamental questions. Um, so LaRouche says that this is the force of tragedy. Now we can go on with the rest of um, this forward. What is too often overlooked about the crafting and performance of classical tragedy and its like is that the subject of the drama is not on the perceived stage, but as Schiller emphasized, the reaction of the mind of the fellow in the balcony of the theater to the way in which the action in the shadow land on stage is brought to life, as if within a memory within that member of the audience. Think about that image. And Schiller further said that the audience should leave the theater better than they entered. And now here's the challenge to all of us who are fighting to organize and to change, to allow people to develop the kind of self-consciousness that you can change yourself mid-motion because you get an insight. The truly classical art of politics is to see ourselves as an actor in that drama of society as a whole on that stage. It were prudent to think in this way of European culture's now global history over a span since about 700 BC. In that way, by understanding the critical aspect of the underlying changes and their outcomes in this span of history, the needed essential ideas come into view. This is the approach we must now summon among ourselves that we might accomplish the needed transformation from the form of human cattle, recognized as persons who are merely voters, to those who think and act as true citizens of a republic like our own. And so I say, this is the challenge which Ben Franklin said to the woman who asked him what had been created at the Constitutional Convention, a republic, if you can keep it. And it is really for us in the United States to return to this conception of the principle of the general welfare, the mission to do good as our national identity which would enable us to have the proper kind of collaboration with every nation on the planet. Okay, thank you, Diane. So we're getting various questions. Let me just jump right into it um, uh, because I think we have uh, a lot that we can discuss and uh, there, there's a lot of ways to proceed with this. Uh, all right, so we have a question, first of all, this one comes from Jose, this is for, for Bill Axie. It was also asked by a second person, it's almost identical question. Um, <laughs> Sun Yat-sen sounds more American than any, quote, communist I've ever heard of. Would it be fair to say that the founding of the Chinese Republic carried ideas congruent with the founding of the United States? And if that's the case, does that mean that modern day China is a better reflection of American ideals as opposed to America, to modern day America? So that's well, that's, that, that's a very interesting question. Um, look, the, the founding of the Republic in, in China did, did not work as well as possible. It was still divided by warlords. And, and, and as you know, Sun Yat-sen 
had to leave or made the decision to leave the presidency because of uh, the, the fear that uh, the warlords would take over unless they were placated to some extent. And, and Yuan Shokai uh, took over after him. But that the ideas of Sun were very much uh, appropriate and, and very much reflective uh, of the, uh, the American Revolution. He talked about it himself in terms of, of the fight, especially between Hamilton and, uh, and Jefferson. I'm, I'm sure he had read the, uh, the Federalist Papers and uh, much of what Hamilton said in that uh, I think was uh, consistent with what what Sun uh, wanted. He, however, he had two things he was worried about. One was the question, okay, you wanted the issue of equality of people, but you also want ability. And of course, in, in ancient China, and he referred to that, you have uh, the leaders who sometimes aren't, aren't really the smartest bulbs, uh, but they, the better of the leaders, they realize that and they try and find the scholars who can help them to lead the country. And he said, in a democracy, you've got a problem because you, you want to have the best people uh, really dealing with the overriding problems, you know, and, and you don't always have that, you know, in what they call a parliamentary democracy. So he was he was trying to feel he never really worked out, I don't think, the solution on how you know, how the democratic situation in China should should work. They, they do have a democracy in China of sorts. I mean, it's look, the, the people do have a say in what they're doing, but it works a little differently uh, than than what we have. And I think Sun was critical of this parliamentary democracy. If he saw, you know, that once every four years, your rights as a, as a citizen or that you can vote for one of the characters that happens to have won his way as uh, as a candidate. And uh, we know what that has been. I mean, look, if uh, Linda LaRouche ran for president, uh, you know, umpteen time, more than eight times, uh, and he was more than qualified to be president of the United States. And I, he did have the capability of winning, I think, the majority of the people to his program, if his program would have ever gotten out. But of course, what happened was that the the people who didn't want, you know, any new paradigm in the United States, which would endanger the uh, the powers that be, they went after him, and and so he couldn't make himself felt. So that's the kind of problem that Sun was also dealing with. But I think the ideals were were very much the same. You've got to understand that in China today, they look very much at the United States, really as a model for much of what they're doing. Um, and they're not doing it because they want to best us. They're doing it because they think that the United States really has made some very important accomplishment. And we saw that during the whole, uh, you know, reform and opening up, you know, that they would set up. We have a, a cabinet or department uh, that deals with such and such a question. They have to have that uh, with regard to their space program. It was, you know, largely under the military and, and the pilots, you know, the, the, the astronauts are to a large extent still military. That, that may well change. But they did create a civilian space agency, I think, because of, of NASA. And what are they doing? Are they making that into a Chinese only thing? No, they're inviting other astronauts to come there. You've got ESA astronauts who are now learning Chinese, some of them becoming rather fluent, who are going to be flying on the Chinese space station. Uh, you also have today, yesterday, um, the uh, the uh, Shenzhou 13 uh, took off and went to uh, the space station for the second round of astronauts. One of those was working with uh, with ESA in Italy and is now fluent in English. So now you have you know Chinese, which is unusual in in the space uh, uh, space uh, community, are are now learning English as well because their space program. Is, is really modeled on what we did. That is opening it up to the rest of the world. We're the ones that are closing it more and more, but they're, they're opening up so that they're, they're copying the model a lot. And I think they're doing that because they think that, that we have achieved some, some really important uh, uh, achievements and they would like to be a part of this. And if there were cooperation, I think we'd find that, that you'd, you'd have a lot of like minds there with regard to that, but because we are shutting ourselves off and we're kind of in a paranoid uh, situation, uh, you know, for fear that really for fear that this this paradigm 
that where control lies in the hands of the oligarchy uh, would be threatened by China. And so we're, we're not playing ball with them. But I think, yes, that the, much of what, what Sun had envisioned, look, I mean, why did Sun, why was Sun critical of, of Karl Marx? It was, a, you know, the Russian Revolution was very important to them at, at that time. And a lot of people joined the Communist Party because they felt this is the way, you know, to, to free China. Uh, and uh, but Sun was against it. He said, because if you look at the reality at what Marx predicted is not happening. And he pointed to Henry Ford. He says, OK, this is their fight between capital and workers. But what happens with Henry Ford? He's, he's producing these cheap cars. They've got a high level of wages. He says, that's a, uh, you know, that's a, a harmony. I, if he used that word, probably did, because it's a, a important Chinese concept between capital and labor, that this this is the way we should have it, you know, and this is what he wanted to do. So very much, not only in the, the formal parliamentary situation, you know, of, you know, creating a, a Congress and, and things like that, but more, more generally in the, uh, in the policy, he was looking at the United States, the accomplishments that we made when we adhered to the American system, he wanted to adopt also in China. And, uh, and I think that was very clear that uh, uh, that, that was a, a great inspiration. Okay, we have a question for you, Diane, and to set this up, I have to give people the context of the question. Uh, during this week, there was a uh, statement uh, that came out from the Schiller Institute called a wake-up call. The danger for mankind is not the climate, but toleration of a devious policy that uses climate to destroy us. Um, and so this discusses that uh, at the coming COP26 summit, Glasgow, uh, Scotland, there's going to be an attempt to ram through a kind of form of depopulation policy. And some people are not too happy about it. Matter of fact, uh, recently, in fact, in the last few days, the Chinese government has made it very clear that they don't intend to abide by the coal, or let's put it this way, that the, due to circumstances beyond, shall we say, anyone's control, they're not going to, in fact, meet the goals that are stated in that document. Now, here's what the question is, Diane. This comes, uh, again, from New York to you. This is, and it's about this, uh, this assemblywoman named Deborah Glick. I just have to look her, look her up here. Member of the New York State Assembly. She represents the Greenwich Village, East Village, West Village, Tribeca area, and Battery Park City, where I happen to once have lived. Uh, and, uh, Here's what happened. She tweeted out this. And then there's a remark from her in addition from uh, earlier. She wrote this. World population in 1950 equal 2.5 billion. World population in 2015, 7.3 billion. The lack of family planning because of religious zealotry has stressed the planet. Something no one wants to think about. Uh, and then um, that was that was yesterday morning. She tweeted that. Uh, and there are these statements uh, that she's made um, uh, saying the following. This is May of 2019. We just have too many people on the planet. She added that limiting population growth needed to be considered as one way to curb pollution. So the yeah, question is for you to respond to that. Well, I'm sorry for anybody who has that view of themselves, first of all, uh, as pollution. Um, we also had uh, had teams, some of our younger organizers used to have a survey that if someone thinks the world is overpopulated, they should give us a list of which of their family members they want to eliminate. Um, it's unfortunate that anyone would sincerely believe this, but it shows a complete misunderstanding of what is the nature of man, which is something that I find particularly powerful and perhaps unfortunately controversial in the statement that you're referring to, which was uh, put out by the Schiller Institute and the Clintel uh, group as, as initiated by, uh, Clintel group being initiated by uh, Dr. Gus Burkhout, who has been on a number of Schiller Institute platforms because it makes the point that human beings are not animals, that human beings are endowed uh, by their creator with a 
an insight, a, a, an ability to create, an ability to change our mode of existence. And therefore, the natural course of development of the universe is for human beings to use their God-given talents to make scientific discoveries, which um, often create conditions where what we call a resource increases exponentially, increases geometrically, uh, in fact, even surpassing the rate of the increase of the population. So Malthus was completely mistaken about this. Um, I think it's one of the worst crimes to teach such nonsense as uh, Deborah Glick is spouting to children who have not had the opportunity to study enough science or philosophy or other matters to be able to refute these arguments. Uh, because I think it would be absolutely horrible to be three or four years old and the prevailing view of your existence is that you are nothing but pollution on the planet. Or as Helga F. LaRouche said, if man is in the image of God and man is pollution, then what does that make God? Pollution? Uh, people should consider this. So I, uh, I think, I mean, obviously it's, it's wrong, it's backwards, but what's more wrong is that it's embarrassing that someone who is an elected official to represent people could have this view and sincerely believe in it. Uh, Bill, we come back to you, and this references an a article that uh, was printed in this latest week's EIR magazine, which is, that's the cover there, how LaRouche foresaw today's hyperinflation. Uh, and it has an article uh, it's written by Jerry Rose, uh, and it, Jerry's article is a review of a book entitled uh, Roosevelt and Stalin, Portrait of a Partnership uh, it's by Susan Butler. Uh, and what the article did uh, was to uh, uh, basically completely change the, na the, the presumed narrative concerning the relationship between Franklin Roosevelt and Stalin. And so we've gotten three or four questions is sort of different, but they all basically ask, well, what was the, uh, when was there a better relationship between the United States and China than now? And what was particularly Roosevelt's relationship uh, to uh, China during the Second World War? They were allies of the United States, but people are asking, what did that consist of? Is there something to be learned from that earlier relationship? Uh, and in what way uh, would that apply or should that apply U.S.-China relations today? Well, it's interesting that the Chinese really um, hold, uphold a tradition uh, of the uh, U.S. Uh, cooperation with China during during World War II. Um, the, uh, the role of the Flying Tigers, which is probably the most well-known of these uh, individuals, pilots who went even before the United States, even before Pearl Harbor, who went and volunteered uh, to serve in the uh, Air Force, really the only Air Force that China had, uh, is uh, still uh, very much honored today uh, by the uh, by the present government. And, and relatives of the Flying Tigers often go there and they have celebrations. Uh, there's also the, the famous story with regard to Roosevelt, of course. You know, he wanted to win the war, but he also wanted to, to win the peace. And he wanted, as, as people generally know, this new paradigm, right, where he told Churchill, no 18th century methods. We're not going to be using them again. The old imperialism is, is dead. And he was committed to, uh, to creating that after the war by the creation of the United Nations, in which all nations would be involved, in which they would be equal in, in the sense of being represented uh, in the uh, United Nations General Assembly. And it would be there that any problems or conflicts or anything like that could be resolved uh, by uh, all of them. And so he was working, he was thinking about that even early during the course of the war. And uh, of, of course, the most important elements there were uh, the relationship, that the relationship with the Soviet Union would have to be central in the post-war uh, world as well. So he tried to develop a very close working relationship with Stalin, which to some extent he really did. Uh, we don't know what would have happened had Roosevelt lived 
if we could have avoided, you know, the Cold War and all that. But there's a good chance that there there were other pathways that would have been open. But Roosevelt definitely wanted uh, a world without imperialism. And, and that's not only the Japanese, but it was also the, the British, uh, the Dutch, uh, the French. All of that should be at an end and new nations should be created. And they would gather in this, you know, United Nations to discuss their interests and to come to you know, compromises or resolve conflicts without going to war, without military conflict. And his relationship, of course, we know that pretty well during the war uh, was the assistance to the Russians. They were on uh, the Eastern Front and they, it was well coordinated with the moves against Nazi Germany, it was both the, uh, the American invasion in Normandy combined with the Russians moving in uh, through Eastern Europe. Uh, and this was uh, the wartime uh, coalition, but also that with China. And the, the issue, of course, was that China was really divided at that point. Um, the, the forces of Dr. Sun in the beginning, they, they included the Communist Party uh, in, in the northern uh, 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 march, in the northern uh, 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 motion to, to, to control China. The Chinese were played an integral role in the military operations. Uh, they they had a uh, a military academy. Uh, the military head of it was Chiang Kai Shek. He was not the chosen successor of uh, of Sun Yat Sen, but he was the military head. And the uh, his assistance was was Zhou Enlai. So until the break, which occurred in Shanghai when uh, Chiang Kai Shek decided to move against the trade unionists who had taken over Shanghai to turn it over to uh, the, uh, the nationalist forces. Uh, he in a compromise with some of the bankers. With the international community, which was very strong in Shanghai, he moved against them, and that broke up the coalition with the communists. So it became separated. So Roosevelt had the problem. You have these guys <clears throat> down there kind of fighting, or at least holding the fort, and then you have this group up in the north uh, which were guerrillas. I mean, the Chinese had to flee uh, when Chiang Kai-shek moved, moved against them. They set up their own military forces. But already from the get-go, uh, Roosevelt was in touch with these people, even before uh, Pearl Harbor. And he, he, and he created a liaison group, much against the wishes of Chiang Kai-shek, at least for a long time. He had to, they had to twist his arm to allow Roosevelt to send uh, a, a military group up to the communists who were fighting in the north, but he wanted to do that because they were fighting and, and they were really harassing and, and giving the Japanese a lot of trouble. And he thought maybe that if there were an invasion, the invasion, invading forces, uh, if the U.S. would invade Japan, that is, the invading forces would probably move from northern China and therefore this contact with the uh, Communist Party forces who were in control of there would be important. So he tried to find an agreement with them. And, and he said even to his dying day, almost before his, you know, he died, a month before he died, he was talking to Edgar Snow, who said to him, he says, how are you going to bring these uh, people together? How are you going to work with the communists in the North when Chiang Kai-shek doesn't want to work with them? And, and Roosevelt just kind of lifted his head and said, well, I've been working with two governments all along now. I think I can do that uh, as we continue forward. So it, uh, the big question is, you know, that uh, if the Civil War had occurred and the United States was not uh, in effective alliance with the, uh, the Kuomintang and, and still had contacts with the uh, Chinese communists, which had been created at that time, maybe we would have avo avoided, you know, this long, long years of separation, including the Korean War. <clears throat> Those are unresolved questions for history. But that, that was the situation then. Okay, we have another question for you, Diane, and I'm going to uh, pose a question uh, and then just uh, just uh, re read something again from the London Economist after I pose you the question. This is from Jacob, a professor in New Jersey. He says, for those who don't want to wear masks, they view uh, the question of the coronavirus as freedom more than the good of everyone. However, these people have also uh, dived deep into the pharmaceutical cartels, means exposing the pharmaceutical cartels. For example, the recent Austrian politician that quit over money from these cartels. What these people find is many over-the-counter therapeutics are very effective in battling COVID, 
the biggest way to not die of COVID is not to be obese, he says. But how do you reconcile the differences between the various people who are on the one hand advocating, you know, for obviously the health measures that are the uh, established health measures, so to speak, uh, and those uh, who are opposed, but are saying that they are defending their freedom and are also uh, very suspicious of the of these companies. Uh, now, now that's the question. That's his question. But I just want to remind people of what I read, which was from the a recent London Economist, saying a few things which I just want to put in. All pandemics end eventually. First of all, that's a completely incompetent statement. I mean, they can end with a lot of people being dead, like bubonic plague. I mean, that was a pandemic. Uh, uh, and But there was no world which was unified by air travel, for example, at the time of the bubonic plague. Uh, and it goes on to state that basically we have to learn to live with this. That is not our policy, certainly. Uh, and that policy would seem to imply various kinds of measures, which are not only draconian, but would be uh, civilization altering. So I just wanted to say that, uh, Diane, before you answer the question, and uh, now you're up. Okay, great. I hope that noise is not too much in the background. It should stop momentarily. No, you're but fine. okay, good. Um, well, the first problem is that the thing that is clear to everybody, or seems to be clear, is that the policy of the government and the policy of the pharmaceutical companies has not been to act in the general welfare. So given that that seems to have been the case, uh, people don't necessarily trust the the results of the vaccine, even though there is an enormous amount of evidence that the vaccine is effective in preventing death from COVID and severe illness and probably somewhat mitigates the spread, although we now know that people who are fully vaccinated can contract and spread COVID, uh, but generally much milder cases. But what is lacking is a certain scientific intent and commitment. For example, uh, when this had first begun, I mean, first of all, when we heard that it had broken out in China, why everyone here immediately presumed that such a thing would never happen in the United States or it wouldn't spread as if we were hermetically sealed from the rest of the world was kind of crazy. Then we had the disaster of all kinds of tests that didn't work. But you never had a top-down mobilization to actually defeat the disease. Where uh, And instead, what you did have very clearly is a bunch of people profiteering off of it. There were 500 new billionaires created uh, during this pandemic. So clearly, there was profiteering off of it. And probably, and certainly, I should say, not probably, still is. But if you think of what a... Um, real crash program would have looked like, perhaps instead of paying people to stay home and do nothing uh, and uh, giving out trillions of dollars to bail out crazy Wall Street speculative ventures, what if we had said, look, we need a massive public sanitation effort. We've got to clean up New York City. We need brigades of young people to go out and do certain kinds of construction and sanitation projects where you can be socially distanced. Maybe they're outdoors, you're, not, you're mitigating the spread and you actually improve the quality of your buildings, of your classrooms. You build, uh, you know, they were very eager to make sure that every restaurant put a tent on the sidewalk, but they weren't so concerned about creating infrastructure that made it possible for people to function. So, uh, you know, I do, uh, it's, it's understand, you can see why there would be a fundamental lack of trust that either the government or the pharmaceutical companies has our best interest in mind. But I would also say that unfortunately, there's been a great deal of confusion introduced into what people think is freedom, because freedom is not really the right to do whatever you want, um, especially if it's going to 
negatively impact someone else, but I would say not even someone else. If what you think you want to do negatively impacts the ability of the entire human race to survive, then that is not really freedom in the most profound sense. And I think to really understand that, it would be good to read uh, various of the Platonic dialogues, particularly the um, Crito, I guess, and the ones, the, the, the trial of Socrates, because Socrates has a completely different idea of freedom. You also see it in Martin Luther King, where you are able to liberate your mind and your thinking from the pressures of the day and the ephemeral self-interest in your own personal mortality, but to place your identity in the realm of the immortal. And that is what actually makes us free, not some of these questions of lesser concern. Okay, Bill, back to you. This is a question is from Jerry from Baltimore. He asked the question, why did Chiang Kai-shek reject uh, Sun Yat-sen, Dr. Sun Yat-sen's policies? Why did he launch a massacre against the communists in 1927 who had been allied to Dr. Sun's Kuomintang party? Were the British involved in this manipulation? So you're going to have to give background so people, I think, get what this refers to. Yeah, yeah, it's very possible. What happened was I mentioned that uh, the the forces of the Communist Party were a part of Dr. Sun's movement. That the decision was made, and of course it was also made internationally. The Comintern uh, was supportive of the Kuomintang because their policy was that you know China is not ready for a socialist revolution, but they they do need this bourgeois revolution, and and we will support it. And the communists uh, were in agreement with that. But there was also a great commitment uh, to the ideas of Dr. Sun among those who were attracted to the uh, to the Communist Party. And the the person uh, there who was closest to Dr. Sun, uh, whose name was uh, Liao Zhao uh, Kun, I believe was his first name. Uh, he was the one he was the considered by Dr. Sun to be his heir. At, at the as the head of the Kuomintang, not Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang Kai-shek was the head of the military, um, but he he had kind of a different attitude. But he was military training, and he did an effective job in organizing uh, the military for Dr. Sun. But this Liao was his uh, chosen successor, and Liao was ass- assassinated, uh, not by Chiang Kai-shek as far as we can see, but by another uh, competitor. Uh, for the ruling of the uh, 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 of the Kuomintang, uh, Hu Hanming, uh, and so he died. Now, now, what happened was that there were split. Chiang Kai-shek started moving uh, to the north uh, with the military forces, including the the Chinese Communist forces. And like I said, Shanghai was still uh, a, a more an international city, but was uh, controlled by the warlords and the uh, the um, uh, trade unions. Uh, took over the city. They had a trade union strike and they took over the city and they were going to hand it to a Sun Yat-sen on a platter if he would come up there. Uh, but there was al- already a split in the Kuomintang between the right and the left. And this had existed under Dr. Sun. You read his um, his uh, three principles, his lectures, and he really gives a warning to you know some of these people. He says, look, uh, my Minsheng, the, my idea of the people's welfare really goes beyond socialism, but it also incorporates that. I mean, so that those who believe in that, they should also support the, the Minshan. And those who are trying to isolate them or to throw them out of the party are absolutely wrong. But that group did exist within the, the KMT and Chiang Kai-shek, uh, whether he was a, a member of it, I don't think he was a part of the right wing, but he uh, compromised with them. And his idea was as the military leader, he would be the leader of the KMT. And there were people who opposed to that, including Sun Yat-sen's wife, who was probably closest to Dr. Sun, having having been with him a long time, uh, who actually allied herself with the left Kuomintang uh, and later allied herself with the Communist Party when when the absolute split came. Um, She um, was critical of Chiang Kai-shek. In fact, 
Her sister married Chiang, Chiang Kai-shek, and she said at a certain point, I would rather see my sister, my love dearly, dead than married with Chiang Kai-shek. So that, that was her view of it. Whatever the case may have been, he made the concrete decision to eliminate the communist forces and to take Shanghai uh, and ally himself with the bankers and with the international community. Because remember, a large portion of Shanghai was controlled by the British, the French, and to a lesser extent, uh, the Americans, and also the Japanese. And, they, and so that he made agreements with them that he would move against the trade unionists, which these guys didn't like, and they would then give him his support. And that's the agreement that he made. And that's why the split came. Um, many of the people who had been in the KMT uh, allied themselves after that split with the, uh, uh, with the uh, uh, Communist Party. In fact, the wife and the, do- and the son of Liao Zhongkai, uh, became communists. It was they were both on the long march and were very close also to Zhou Enlai, who of course was a member of that grouping, the KMT uh, military academy down there. And uh, the the irony of the story is that that that, that son of Liao Zhongkai was the person that uh, that went with uh, Deng Xiaoping to Japan to look at the Shinkansen. Uh, the 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 uh, magnetic uh, levit- the uh, high speed tra- rail in Japan, and so that the, there's a, a continuity from that the old KMT supporters to the Communist Party. But Chang had made a, a political decision on that. Uh, there was also a uh, an important political point that Dr. Sun was uh, totally uh, committed to a reform of the whole land situation. He didn't want the landowners to continue to control the land. He wanted the peasants or the farmers to actually have their own property. And he was trying to work out a scheme of doing that. But that was a central part of his program. And of course, that was what Chiang Kai-shek said, didn't say that he denied. He says, no, that will come long after we you know, unite the country. We'll, we'll start thinking about that. So that was one of the things that were at least uh, temporarily eliminated. Uh, in so at in practice in Sun's program, which of course the communists they they were the ones who organized the peasantry as a result of that. Uh, so it, it, in one sense, it was probably a big mistake because by doing that, by allying himself with really with the British and with the landowners, with the with the foreign groupings in Shanghai, uh, in order to get their support, he he lost really lost the mandate of heaven. That is. He really lost the support of the people, which was, you know, the peasantry. And, and I think the reason that the, the Chinese won the Civil War more than anything else was that they, in their own actions, they had won the support of the peasantry during the course of World War II. Question is also for you, Bill. It goes back to sort of the area of economy. This is from Alvin. And he asked the question, uh, Sun Yat-sen recognized the superiority of Hamilton's form of government. Uh, Republican form of government over Jefferson's promotion of a pure democracy. P- please elaborate on the difference between the Hamilton from the Hamiltonian perspective. We hear words like democracy and communism, but they're poorly understood. That's the question. Okay, um, I touched on this to a certain extent with this uh, question that Sun was dealing with in terms of equality versus ability you know, to have having people of ability uh, in, in power. Hamilton, I think, dealt with that. And people who, you know, read the Federalist Papers realized that, that, that he didn't want this, you know, this pure democracy, which is why he, you know, evolved the, the system of the difference between the, you know, the Senate and the, uh, and the House. And in fact, the difference in the voting to the extent where it's not just the popular mood alone, which determined the course of the country, uh, but it, it was something something more basic uh, because he felt, as, as was also clear with, pa- with Plato, Plato's criticism of Aristotle's democracy, that if, if the momentary mood of the population rules the government policies, 
this can lead to disaster because that mood can easily be shifted. I mean, what, what are we seeing here in the United States? Uh, but the, the problems uh, uh, with democracy. And I don't, I don't know that he, Dr. Sun had totally resolved it. <clears throat> I mean, his, his temporary policy was we will have ultimately this type of voting, you know, democracy at, at a certain point. But in the interim, because of the nature of China, we're going to have to have a system in which, you know, there is um, the, uh, 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 what do you call it? guardrails created so that, that, that those who understand the needs of the country will determine the policy in order to create the, uh, you know, the rejuvenation of China. And, you know, at, at that point, we can think of what's happening. What, what we see, you know, in the Communist Party is uh, there, there is a sense of democracy. Look, there, there are various parties in China, not just the Communist Party. The Communist Party is dominant. And it's actually the biggest party. But you have other parties as well. In fact, you have representatives of the Kuomintang, the Chinese Kuomintang as a party. And they they are represented in the the two legislators, where it's the National People's Congress and a, an advisory group, which was set up by the KMT, as a matter of fact, which was called the, the Chinese People's uh, Consultative uh, Conference, in which these other parties would have a stay, a, a say. And and what you have in in terms of when the National People's Congress gets together once a year in Beijing. But there are all kinds of meetings, and there's a standing committee that is in operation throughout the year. And throughout the year, you have this grassroots uh, movement of people submitting uh, the problems that exist on the local uh, level uh, or uh, proposals for changes in policies. And there are several millions of these that circulate. And, and they, of course, with the Internet, they're circulating more widely and more widely discussed. And before that Congress meets, there have already been, you know, literally a, a, a million or hundreds of thousands at any rate, proposals that have been considered or rejected or accepted before the Congress actually comes together and talk. We don't have that in the United States. The only thing we had similar to that was these memorials that are that are not, I don't know if they're totally forbidden now, but of course, they're not playing a major role, which can be submitted to the Congress by, you know, individuals, by legis state legislators or others uh, to talk about issues that are, that are of concern for the general people. I, I think in one sense, China has a better system of that than, than, than we have here. The other thing that, uh, that they have is what uh, in this new document they issued, they're talking about what they call whole process, the development of whole process democracy. I'm not exactly sure of what all that means, but there's an attempt to create a reform in which people at the bottom, and this is what Sun wanted to, be, to, to achieve, that the people at the bottom somehow have a, a possibility of expressing their views, of saying what they want, what they don't want. And they, there is a system that is in place, and I think it's going to be developed even more. And these are taken very, very seriously. And, and Xi Jinping himself, I'm, I'm, I admire what he does in his travels within China. He goes to every little single village you know, and sits down with these villagers and he talks to them and he tells them, you know, what is the policy? And he asks them, what are your problems? You know, how are you doing? You know, I mean, that's that's something that's, you know, rarely seen except during, during uh, election year time that you see politicians doing and it, it's being done in China so that they do have this form of democracy. And I think it's it's highly consistent uh, with the idea that uh, that uh, Sun Yat-sen had because he didn't want to imitate the European system. He did. He didn't want to uh, imitate any other system. He wanted to take what he thought was useful and relevant and apply that to the Chinese situation uh, in order to develop uh, a you know a government system. But he never really had a fully worked out system. But he had the basic principle that this is the principle that is the Minsheng, the people's interest that is fundamental. And I, I think that's also uh, relevant today. It's also being practiced today in its own way in today's China. 
Okay, we have kind of, again, an array of questions. I'm going to really combine them, but they all converge around how uh, how should we understand or uh, how do you understand China's relationship to both the Great Reset, Green New Deal, given that you, uh, China's the leading, world's leading producer of solar panels and so all kinds of other things, but at the same time, they've just made this announcement around, um, announcement around coal uh, that they're not going to be reaching the goals of that of the uh, of the COP26, uh, and uh, at the same time, they are also pushing ahead on the front of nuclear power and so on. What what are they doing? Is this a game that they're playing? Do they feel uh, uh, that they have to do this because of pressures from the outside world? Are they uh, are they making money from solar panels? What is it? So that's sort of a way of putting three or four things, which would be best yeah, stated. I, I think in one sense, maybe it's all of the above in, in one <laughs> sense, but I think that the, ba the basic thing I think is the following, that I, I think it's fundamental and, and I, I, you know, nobody has a crystal ball in this. I don't have, you know, access to all the internal discussions going on, but there are differences of opinions within China on, on all of these issues. But the, 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 I think the basic policy is, and it was shown in this decision on the coal plants in China to begin you know, producing more coal because they need the energy, uh, is that the, the Minsheng trumps everything else. That is, the people's livelihood really trumps everything else. Um, there is a, uh, an understanding you know, of environmental problems in China that everybody knows who's traveled there at any any point realizes it's the case, the water, the desert. And Sun Yat-sen was also aware of this. Uh, interesting in his, uh, in his uh, lectures, he also talked about, you know, the, the desert areas. And he said, we could do reforestation here uh, and, you know, chain help to improve the climate. And, and China has done this more than anybody else. This is really an unsung story that they have this this project called the Sanhai Bay, Sanhai Ba, which was a large desert area, and and this was done. This was before the the uh, uh, the reform and opening up, even in the fifties. You know, it's individual farmers that would go out there and they would you know plant trees. There, you know, farmers who had their farm and they would take it upon themselves. Well, I got to plant a tree this year. We got to plant another tree this year. And over the period, this is this is now what was a desert is now a, a, a forest area. Um, and, and these things are, have been going on for a long time. There's a tradition of that, of course, in China, because agriculture was central <clears throat> to China, so that the issues of water and irrigation and, and clean water and, you know, green mountains and all that stuff that she talks about is a part of the Chinese tradition. And, and they, they will adhere to that. And, and their program is geared to primarily dealing with these, uh, you know, fundamental problems. Uh, even in the coal issue, they're, they're building new coal plants in China, but they're, they're closing the old ones. Uh, they're taking ones that are highly pollutive and, and they're introducing, you know, clean energy and all this other stuff in order to, uh, to meet the needs. And now they have this commitment, <clears throat> which I think is largely done politically, because they they feel that they are under the gun, and then they are uh, from you know from the the Anglo American crowd and and others, and they feel that somehow uh, the role that they've been playing in this environmental issue it brings them closer to the Europeans or brings Europe closer to them, and therefore they've got to maintain the, their the front so that they don't open up another avenue of attack. By the West, you, and and it is it is a real thing. Remember, after they made this decision on coal, about two or three days later, there was a large article in the New York Times which attacked China for being the polluters for building all these coal plants in in the third world. So uh, that's also an important consideration because they don't want to remain; they don't want to be alone in confronting the aversive environment that they exist in, so that they're looking for allies. And I think this has been, been a part of it. But my, my feeling is that they, they are not going to go the route of Malthusianism. They may not confront it head on 
as they probably should, as they did at this uh, famous conference that uh, Helga was at in uh, in uh, Budapest, uh, where she confronted the uh, the zero growthers and the only one, the only country that was on her side or was doing the same thing were the Chinese, who you know who at that time were very much against Malthusianism, um, and uh, and they uh, they will, I think, you know, stop at the point where anything becomes a threat. Domestically, I think they will continue building out their industry. Sure, they're doing a lot of solar plants, and Xi Jinping mentioned in his speech, but they're building them, you know, in the desert, in the rocky areas, as places where the sun is always shining and they can win uh, energy that way. But they're also doing the clean coal. Uh, they're doing uh, they're doing nuclear, and they're doing it very quickly. They're at the fourth generation. They're the only ones now who have this pebble bed reactor uh, that has been talked about for decades. Uh, and they have a working commercial reactor. I think it's supposed to begin produce, be linked to the energy grid before the end of this year. And that's that's something that they, they're thinking of uh, use, utilizing not only domestically, but also for export. So I think in the long run, and they do have until 2060, you know, according to their, you know, what they said they've committed to, uh, before they have to be carbon free. And in that time, a lot of things can happen. I don't know if the nuclear development can happen that quickly because it's it's a difficult thing. Building a nuclear plant is not an easy task, but I, they are moving in that direction. And this emphasis on science and technology uh, is central to what they're doing. And I think they are looking at that as the real solution to their energy problem, including fusion energy. And believe me, their program, their lunar program, is largely determined by this issue of resources and, and the, the issue of helium-3 on the moon. And, uh, and they're, they're going to do it. I mean, they, there was a story today after the, uh, the launch of these three astronauts where Yang Li Wei, the first astronaut, had said that we are doing studies of, uh, of lunar landing. And uh, they're looking at, uh, at the Apollo landings, how they did it. So, I mean, things are going to happen on this front that I think will, they feel, probably leadership feels that this will be the ultimate solution to this energy problem. But uh, I, I don't think they're going to go the way of uh, Malthusianism because they've, in one sense, they've been there, done that with this, with this one child policy. And they are ruining the day at this point over this because of the effects on the population. I don't think they're going to go back there because they, they're on a different track. Okay, this is for you, Diane. It's actually, uh, I'm going to combine two questions. One is from Howard, and the other one, I don't know who this is actually from, but I'll, uh, I'll add this. Uh, maybe this is two from him. Uh, China has defeated COVID in China. In New York State, about 200,000 get tested per day. Um, this is not enough. It means not enough people being tested. This is not ending the epidemic in New York State. We could be looking at another upsurge nationally over the holidays, what will happen then? Can China help? And then I think this is actually may also be from him. It says in the inflationary collapse, we see moves to cut off the USA from the Chinese economy. This is a disaster. Can this be stopped? This is directed to you, Diane. Hmm. Well, I think can it be stopped? That that depends on whether we can change the way that uh, Americans think about our relationship to China, and frankly, the way Americans think about our relationship to ourselves uh, and to what our republic is supposed to represent. Um, on the the first part of this question, you know, again, actually having an open dialogue with the Chinese would be extremely helpful. I would be curious to know what they would think about how we can deal with this here. Obviously, 200,000 tests per day in a state that has about 19 million or so people is um, extremely low. You're not going to find out where the infection actually is. And part of this whole thing and part of the problem, which lends to hysteria, is nobody seems all that interested in knowing anything. Everything's just supposed to be based on hearsay. You know, they, somebody says do this, someone else says do that. Uh, we're not going to present evidence. We're not going to do actual testing. Um, 
So that's a problem. I, I found it interesting. Uh, some months ago, I heard a discussion on CGTN um, where they were asking a Chinese I'm not sure if he was in the area of public health, uh, but they were saying, how should the United States proceed at this point? Do you think the United States needs to do another lockdown? And he said, well, I think people are really tired. You're gonna have to deal with the fatigue factor. I don't think you can do that anymore. He said, I'll give you an example. When we get a COVID outbreak in a city, then we lock down everything and we do 11 million tests or 8 million tests in 48 hours. And we find out where the cases are. And then the people who are infected are quarantined and the people who are not go about their daily business. Because of course, if you test 11 million people and you find 75 with that are positive for COVID and they're all in a particular apartment complex or a particular area, then it's relatively easy to manage it. And you don't have to keep putting people on these interminable sort of half in, half out lockdowns. In the United States, uh, I'm afraid, but I, I don't even, you know, I was going to say that we have so many cases still that it's already beyond that kind of lockdown. But frankly, we don't even know. That's the really stupid thing. We don't even know because we're simply not doing the testing. And as I said earlier, we don't have an approach to actually eradicating the disease. I think living with viruses that can kill people who are vulnerable uh, is a stupid thing to accommodate to. I think we should eradicate it. We should cure cancer. We should cure Parkinson's. Uh, I think it's kind of odd that in the United States we say it's normal for 64,000 people to die of the flu every winter. Why should that be? So it's, um, again, it gets back actually to that statement by Clintel and the Schiller Institute about the devious climate fraud being used to impose all kinds of policies because you have to consider what's the nature of man. And if you have an appropriate conception of the nature of man, then your policy will flow from that. Okay, I think in, uh, in summary, what we're going to do is ask each of you to respond to a graphic we're going to put up. You actually have began to touch on it right there, Diane. You've referenced it before. This is uh, LaRouche's typical collapse function. And I think what we're going to do is go to you first, Bill, uh, to say something about, uh, well, let me put it this way. You've described extensively what the, how the Chinese economy has been functioning. You've described implicitly uh, a completely different orientation. Uh, and, and of course, that's the view that Lin uh, used to try. In fact, he used that in 1995. He developed it as a way of trying to discuss at a conference in Italy uh, with a group of people who were not economists, how to think about the process that people were actually confronted by and what should be done about it. And just in, in whatever summary remarks you'd like to give us on the whole, I'd like you to have that graphic in mind and sort of tell us something about how you think American policy, both toward China and toward the world, might use some of what you've already outlined uh, in terms of these positive possible uh, cultural handles, including what Xi Jinping seems to be saying, to, to change the direction that society's present going. Well, th there are a couple of things that I, I can say on that. One, of course, <clears throat> is what, what the Chinese want to do, and this is, this is what's causing all this ferment, is that they're talking about the issues of global governance. They don't want to take over the world, uh, but they would like the world to operate a little better. And uh, this is something that I think really came home to them in the 2008 financial crisis. Um, they realized that many, many of much of the advice that they had been getting from the West, you know, Western economists on this issue, uh, proved to be totally wrong. And so they began re-examining uh, their own situation. And, and of course, they, they've had for some time something equivalent to the Glass-Steagall, but they also have all these new things that are developing, the digital currencies, the, you know, the internet. 
uh, which requires uh, oversight so that they're, they're very keen uh, with the understanding of what had happened with the Western financial system in 2008, that this not happened to them. And we're seeing that, uh, I think, in all the statements that are being made with regard to the, uh, the financial uh, situation. And of course, this latest uh, crisis with the, um, uh, with the housing market, with this Evergrande, which is also having its effect in China, but it's not a, a situation where they're going to bail that out. If you look at the graph, you know, they're not going to add to those financial assets and create new bubbles but find a way of bringing this thing down without uh, bringing down the economy or bringing down the housing market. And they're, they're still grappling with this, but they're doing it from an entirely different viewpoint. But I think uh, more importantly is that they, they would like, it's, it's not only their own system, but it's the world system which they feel is the problem. It's a world system that has really been uh, created uh, not in the interests of the developing sector countries, as we see from the fact that over 40 years uh, since the post uh, Bretton Woods system, the developing world has gone uh, downhill the whole time. Uh, so that they they need new financial structures or reforms of the present financial structures, which are oriented towards uh, the people's interests, towards this min shung. So what they have as their own orientation to the country, they would like to contribute the knowledge of this uh, in order to try and deal uh, with, with some of the world problems. Uh, and uh, that's why there's this whole issue and all these statements that are being made, they're talking about the need for a better global governance, and that would be a reform of this whole WTO system in order to create something that I, I think Franklin Roosevelt really intended to do a system that would benefit uh, all of the peoples. Um, there was also uh, something else on the uh, on the matter uh, that is of importance um, that I think uh, I was thinking about, uh, but maybe I have now forgotten. But that that's the basic thing that they they intend. Well, the other thing, of course, is the science and technology that they have discovered the key to what the American system was. And the key was the orientation towards science and technology. And once that became clear to them, they have gone overboard to make this the lifeblood of their economy, because they realized that to the extent that you have, and this, this of course is something that Lynn was talking to them about many times during all these interviews he had, and it, it obviously has taken some effect. We had people coming uh, to the to the office many years ago in the 1970s to look at the LaRouche Riemann model. So this is not totally unknown in, in China, but they they have learned this lesson that that this must be the key, that if you lose the grip on continual innovation, your economy is going to be in trouble. So it's it's not the preservation of values from yesterday but is the creation of values for tomorrow, which is important. And this is the basis of, of their economic system at the present moment. I think this is the type of thing they would like to create uh, uh, worldwide and, and what they're doing like in space, uh, things like that, they, I, I think that's, uh, that's the paradigm. And they got that from us to some extent. Look, they're, they're going to go back to the moon. What are they looking at? They're looking at the Apollo program. How did we do that? Right. And we're no longer looking at that or only looking at that kind of uh, the, the corner of our eye. Uh, but I think because they are doing that, this will create the kind of momentum where both the United States and other countries will begin to move in that direction. But I, I think this is what they want. This is their solution to this, this kind of crisis, the, the crisis that was described in the, the, the triple curve. Uh, and uh, and I, I think they do have the key to uh, to dealing with this, and they've learned some of the lessons of that. And if, if we would work to them on together on that, not just on trade, but in terms of the financial structures, I think the world uh, would move in an entirely different direction. Okay, and Diane. Well, I would just urge um, people to really think profoundly about 
where we are, both from the standpoint of the potential and the very real danger, which I don't think has fully hit people. And we have this triple curve function, which as you saw when you have, uh, this is not three separate curves. It's, it's a function of the relationship between the monet, you know, money printing uh, or M3 uh, financial instruments like the stock market, et cetera, and your actual physical production and the relationship these areas of economy now at the moment have to each other is that the more you destroy the physical economy, the more the stock market goes up. But when you get to the vertical asymptote of the system, you've heard the expression hit the wall, it's over and it is not likely to be a very controlled uh, explosion at this point unless certain emergency measures were to be taken. It is a little bit like someone jumping out of an 80-story building, this worship of the stock market and saying, we, I'm going so fast and it's getting faster and faster and I can't imagine when I get to the basement how fast I'll be going. Well, <laughs> something happens when you get to the ground floor which dramatically changes your trajectory and future. Uh, and that is what we are heading for. So it is absolutely urgent that we stop worshiping this financial system and actually put the whole thing through bankruptcy, as Linda LaRouche said so many times. And along with that, we need Glass-Steagall separation of the banks. And we need to take the Federal Reserve, which is a totally unconstitutional private bank, and a nationalize it, have a national bank, have a national bank that can build mm. infrastructure and that can do all these other things, mm. which could be done. And we have people, the Army Corps of Engineers and others who've mapped out, you know, just about every millimeter of the nation who would know what needs to be built where. And I think we'll see if we want to get this done at any regular speed, uh, as opposed to taking 50 years to fill a pothole, that we will find ourselves collaborating with the Chinese. That's what I say. Okay, well, Diane Sayer, Bill Jones, and Rusty, I want to thank you all for being with us today uh, for this show, <laughs> with this presentation. And uh, I want to thank everybody at home who's also, uh, or if you're not at home and you're watching, uh, and uh, invite you to uh, join us in the mobilization that we're now involved in. I have a few things to say uh, and here's the question I'd like to leave people with today. Can an artist, a great artist, paint a picture of the future? Uh, is it possible through the use of classical principles of art, whether we're talking about music or we're talking about painting or poetry, to illustrate what lies ahead and allow people to see what to confront, what they will have to confront? Uh, apparently, that's what Francisco Goya, the great uh, Spanish painter, did. He lived from 1749 until 1827, I believe. And in 1799, he, uh, he composed something called Los Caprichos. It was a set of illustrations and drawings. And some people thought they were, they were only about uh, Spanish life and some of the problems in the post-revolutionary uh, period in Spain that still existed. But I'd like to argue that he did something a little bit better than that. Uh, I'm gonna show you his uh, Ya Es Hora, this is, a, this is the ending, uh, traditional ending of Los Caprichos. And while it may simply look to you like a group of perhaps goblins and maybe, uh, shall we say, uninspired clerics, I would argue to you that this is probably what Joe Biden is going to see when he goes and meets with Pope Francis. Now, there's another element. Maybe this is not that. Maybe this is a meeting of uh, the upcoming COP26 summit, or maybe it's a meeting of something which you probably haven't heard of called the Council for Inclusive Capitalism with the Vatican. So perhaps this is also a, a warning in one sense to, uh, to uh, those inside of the Catholic Church that have a different view, a view that John Paul II had and the view that others have had, which is that development is the new name for peace. Pope Paul VI uh, spoke about that. And I just want to tell you a little bit about this Council for Inclusive Capitalism. Uh, this is from their own website. 
Council for Inclusive Capitalism with the Vatican was launched with the aim of establishing, quote, a new historic partnership between some of the world's largest investment and business leaders and the Vatican. The council was founded by Lynn Forrester de Rothschild, wife of Evelyn de Rothschild and CEO of E.L. Rothschild. This council will follow the warning from Pope Francis to listen to the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor and answer society's demands for a more equitable and sustainable model of growth, Ms. Rothschild said. The council is led by a core group of global leaders known as Guardians for Inclusive Capitalism, which meet annually with Pope Francis and Cardinal Turkson. These leaders represent more than $10.5 trillion in assets under management, a council statement says. The same figure given by Mark Carney, who is a par prominent member of the Guardians, for his green finance initiative. Now, that same Mark Carney is a person that we've talked about for many years now, two years, who called for financial regime change when he was in, uh, in uh, at Jackson Hole, Wyoming a couple of years ago. People at the time interpreted that as being primarily a call uh, to arms against Donald Trump, who had made a speech uh, and would make a speech at the United Nations saying that the, the, the future does not belong to the globalists, it belongs to the nationalists. That's the way he would express it. But perhaps there's something more to say here about how to think about the ghouls that are about to try to assemble the world in Scotland. Uh, where some people have made it very clear they don't intend to go to commit suicide. Now, we've heard a lot about environmentalism. We hear a lot about carbon footprints. And we just had in that uh, tweet from the uh, state assemblywoman from New York, kind of a picture of the real picture. And if you would like to test this yourselves, just go around and start to ask people the question, do you think that the world needs more people? then just let them answer. And you might find that actually all that talk about global warming and climate change and CO2 footprints and sustainability is all re only about one thing. A lot of people don't think you and I should exist. Matter of fact, going back to what that state assemblywoman pointed out, she used the idea that in 1950, there were two and a half billion people in the world. And I have, on my own uh, uh, occasions, brought this up because ask yourself this question. Did anyone think in 1950 that the world was underpopulated? I mean, what, was anybody in the human race at that time running around saying, we need a whole lot more people in the world because the planet's going to die because there's too few people? So there are some people that one should know exist in the world, and they tend to have a lot of money. And they tend to think of themselves as the park rangers of the human race. They call themselves things like guardians for inclusive capitalism. And they believe that if there's 8 billion people, well, you know, that might be 5.5 billion two people too many. But now how you're going to uh, get those people that are part of that 5.5 billion to agree to go away, mm, it's a problem. And therefore, much of what is often referred to as economic theory, econometric theory, monetary theory, uh, theory of governance, uh, and so forth, uh, projects for democracy, there's something else. There's a monster that hides underneath that. And Goya was aware of what that monster was because he had seen it in Spain. He saw it in the way in which reaction, including in the French Revolution itself, brought this French military under Napoleon to crush Spain, uh, a Spain which was not too great shakes to begin with, uh, and ultimately essentially killed that impulse toward uh, what uh, Goya and his collaborators had hoped to establish through the National Bank of Spain and, by the way, through an important collaboration with the American Revolution, which Carlos III had, in fact, uh, been involved in. He gave as much money nearly as. Uh, as the French uh, government gave to support the cause of the American Revolution. But that revolutionary impulse was destroyed. What we have today in today's world is a chance to actually finish something that was attempted during the revolutions of 1776 and some of the subsequent important political developments that happened. And when we talk about people like Sun, Dr. Sun Yat-sen or others, uh, that, uh, or Franklin Roosevelt, 
we're talking about a tradition that America should embrace again. It came from here. There's no reason that Americans therefore can't regain it. When you look at Afghanistan, and you look at what's happened with that nation, and you look at our role in what happened to that nation, including our role in the drug traffic that happened from that nation. And then you look on the streets of America and you look all over America. You don't just look in black neighborhoods in the cities, you look in white neighborhoods in the, in the agricultural sectors, not even in the suburbs. Just look at any area where poverty reigns and some places where affluence reigns and you see what we are doing to ourselves. We're suggesting to you that we should study what Francisco Goya was trying to tell us in something like Los Caprichos. We should study the classical principles of art and of tragedy of dramatists such as Friedrich Schiller and the properly interpreted William Shakespeare as well. And we should declare that now is the time, ya es ora, which is the caption on Goya's uh, uh, cartoon, that this is the time to move against that group of ghouls that would have us try to eliminate billions of people from the planet under the benevolent cover of climate change, global warming, sustainability, and caring for the planet. There's a conference that will be happening starting on Halloween uh, in Glasgow, Scotland. We hope that all of you will help us, join us in helping to have that conference uh, not only be uh, a kind of con con condemned to the dustbin of history, but perhaps be aborted in the same way that the people that like putting on these conferences believe in aborting the human race. Let's, let's, let's preempt them. Let's declare that now is the time for the real people of the real world uh, to rise up and declare that, yes, the world needs more people, good people, intelligent people, prosperous people, and that the prospects for extending that real world to everyone are with us now. So on behalf of the Schiller Institute, I want to thank everybody for joining us, and I want you to help us in the campaign that we have just enunciated.